Okay, uh, turn your Bible, if you would, to uh, 1 Timothy. You are muted. We can't <laughs> you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, I apologize for that moment. Um, turn your Bible, if you would, to the book of 1 Timothy. And um, so we're going to go verse by verse through 1 Timothy. I absolutely do not promise that I'll be able to do it as quickly as Daniel sometimes does. <laughs> um, but I, I uh, trust the Lord that he will guide me in my pace. Amen. Um, first Timothy, as he does with you. Uh, so first Timothy and, um, well, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's open in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for your words. I pray, dear God, that you make this study effectual, that you make it stick, that you open our understanding, and that you not just help us to understand it in an academic way of just information that we know about, Lord, but something that we're meant to follow and obey. And give us the grace to do that, Lord, to, to have the willingness and the courage to hold faith and a good conscience, as you say, to war a good warfare, to fight the good fight, and to keep these charges um, that Paul makes in, in, these, bo- in these letters. Uh, fill us with your spirit. It's in Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. All right, the book of First Timothy. Um, is one of seven books in the New Testament that is addressed to an individual. Uh, the book of Acts uh, is written by Luke to Theophilus. Uh, First and Second Timothy is written by Paul to Timothy. Titus is written by Paul to Titus. Philemon by Paul to Philemon. And the books of Second and Third John are written from the elder who I believe is the Apostle John, um, Second John to the elect lady, and uh, Third John to a fellow named Gaius. Um, in the book of First Timothy, there are six chapters, 113 verses, 2,260 uh, words. And the book, uh, while addressed to an, indivi- to, ind- to an individual, Timothy, which we'll talk about who he was um, maybe next time, um, just because a book is addressed to an individual, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of us, that it's not addressed to the rest of us. Um, one thing I've learned about reading the Bible and interpreting the Bible is study the shall I self approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And one of the things that you have to look for, a question you have to ask whenever you're reading scripture is who is this addressed to? Uh, because some things are addressed to certain people in the Bible that absolutely are not addressed to you and you should not follow. Like go baptize yourself in the river Jordan seven times, for example. Or, or uh, you know, Jesus went and hanged himself, uh, go thou and do likewise, <laughs> and things like that. There are things in the Bible that are addressed uh, to people that are not addressed to us. The law, for example, uh, the Ten Commandments are not addressed uh, directly to us. What we have is the words of Jesus Christ um, in the New Testament, where he gives us specific instruction uh, fulfilling the law, uh, but, but not being under the law. And so w- one thing I've learned is that if it can apply to you, if it can apply to you, then it does. And it means everything that it can mean, unless you can prove that it doesn't mean that in the context or a cross reference which means that there's more than one application to every verse. And this, uh, Study tonight is not about interpretation, although God led me to make that point. Um, But I want you to notice a couple things. This is addressed to an individual, but that doesn't mean that it's not also addressed to others. So keep your finger here and turn to Philemon, uh, book of Philemon. 
uh, another of the seven books in the New Testament that's addressed to an individual. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, which is the same Timothy that he writes to in, in the letter, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow labor. So it's addressed to Philemon. And to our beloved Aphia, or Aphia, if you're going to uh, make a point of it, <laughs> and Archippus, or Archippus, you know, however it's correctly pronounced, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So there's a whole group of people um, that are in the house slash household of Philemon, which is also a church that this letter of Philemon is being addressed to. While specifically addressed to Philemon, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, it's also addressed to everybody else that he names here. Um, so it's, it's, uh, so just because a letter is addressed to a, a person, that doesn't mean it's not also a uh, useful or can be, um, applied to everybody else. All right. Uh, keep your finger in Timothy and turn to Colossians chapter four, Colossians chapter four and look down in verse uh, 16. And he said, well, actually, uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. So Timothy's there, same Timothy, there with Paul when he's writing to the Colossians. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the letter is addressed specifically to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. But then in, in chapter 4, verse 16, he said, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So a letter here is written to a church, but there's a whole group of people today called hyperdispensationalists that will make this letter only applicable to that individual group of people in the past. Um, and that kind of technique to isolate scripture and keep you from, from, from applying it, from being able to obey it. And especially in Timothy. And the reason why they do that in Timothy is because Timothy says some things and he, and he gives an example, or uh, excuse me, Paul says some things to Timothy, um, and gives instruction to do things and talks about people in a certain way that is highly offensive. To most people. Uh, take for example verse 6. From which some. Or actually verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And of a good conscience. And of faith unfeigned. So those all sound pretty good. That's pretty not offensive right? But then look at verse 6. From which some having swerved. Have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say. Nor whereof they affirm. Which brings me to my next point, um, that the tone and the force of the way that Paul writes to Timothy is different than the way he writes to other people. So, for example, keep your finger here in Timothy and turn back to Philemon. We should have just stayed there, right? <laughs> turn to Philemon and look down in verse, uh, look down in verse 8. First, well, start, first start in verse 4. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith. So I, I thank God for you. I pray for you all the time, and I thank God for you in my prayers because of your love that you have toward all the saints and toward the Lord Jesus and for your faith. So you're a good guy, and I love you, and I thank God for you, and I'm praying for you. But what I'm praying for, verse 6, is that you learn how to pass your faith on to other people because right now you can't. It's not effectual because you're not acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus because you're not forgiving, which is the whole point of this letter. But look down at verse eight. Where, so he's got some hard instruct, some, 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 a hard instruction to give to Philemon. Something that, okay, you're not doing something right that you need to be doing. 
But instead of the way that he talks to Timothy, he says to Philemon in verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, I could just command you. I could charge you like I charged my own son in the faith, Timothy. I could, I could uh, uh, lord it over you. I could, as he said, uh, be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient and exercise the authority full authority and weight of my apostleship and say, no, I'm Paul the Apostle and I represent Jesus Christ and you need to do this right now. I could do that. But look at verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten my bond. Instead of ordering you, I'm going to beg you, he says. Instead of making it a commandment, even though I am telling you this is what you should do, I'm begging you to do it. I can't make you do it. I want you to do it willingly so you can have some reward from it. See? So the tone, but you see the difference in tone between that and uh, like verse 3, for example, of Timothy, as I besought thee still to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And then verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou uh, by them mightest war a good warfare. And many other times, um, it's it's a charge, it's a command, it's a sacred trust that is committed as a father commits something to his son. I don't know how many times I've told uh, my son Daniel, uh, I love you. And God has given me things in my life. He's taught me things. And those things belong to you. And it's my job not just to tell you what they are, but I have to charge you and commit them to you. I I have a responsibility to make sure that it's not just academic to you. I have to impart them to you to the, to the, to the extent of my ability and power, um, which is obviously limited. <laughs> In my ability and power, but in Christ, but I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Amen. And I trust God to to help me and you uh, with those things. But you see, the point that I'm making is that the tone and the force is different between a letter like Philemon and a letter like Timothy. Take, for example, also the letter to the Corinthians. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter uh, eight. And look down in verse, let me get there. Second Corinthians 8. Uh, now he says in chapter, in 1 Corinthians 14, the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. He says, this is, this is scripture. This is the commandments of the Lord. You should do these things. And that is how you should take it. But as a minister, the way that you deal with people should vary depending on how God leads you. And the way that a father deals with his children, his son in particular in this case, is particularly stronger than he would deal with any other person. Um, And here's an example of him not dealing that strong strongly with people. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and look down in verse... Uh, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Speaking of giving. I speak not by commandment, he says. Not, I'm not commanding you. But by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. So I'm not going to command you, but this just came up, this example of the those in Macedonia and Achaia um, in verses 1 and 2 of how they gave out of their deep poverty. They came up as an example, so that just was an opportunity to exhort you to do the same, um, which I already talked to you about in the past. But look at verse, not me, Paul is saying that. Uh, but look at verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, 
That's uh, Philippians 2. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And listen to this. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. It's referring to um, what they started a year ago that he already talked to them about. And first he says it's not by commandment, and then he says it's advice. So that's an entirely different tone than the tone that he uses with Timothy. Um, take also, for example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look down in verse uh, uh, chapter 2, sorry, I was in chapter 4. And look down in verse... Oh, where is it? I had it written right here. Okay, well, this is one of the verses I wanted to go to, but 2 verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. So that same idea. Um, well, I can't find the other one I was looking at. I, I, I forgot to write down the other one I was looking at. But um, So there's that idea of charging. Of, he said in chapter 2 and verse 2, The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So in this day and age of Bible colleges and Bible institutes and information a la carte, because we live in the information age where anybody can learn how to do anything they want to at any moment at the touch of a button from their living room. You want to learn how to blow up the United Nations? You can do that by going on the Internet and reading a few articles. You should not do that. Do not misquote me. But, it, you know, I'm just making the point. You can learn any piece of information that's out there. You want to find out how the, you know, Rockefellers and the Bilderbergers and the Council of the Illuminati and all the conspiracies that are under the sun, you can go find out what everybody's saying about them. And you can probably find out what the, the truth about them that way. Because information is available for free, as it was in the garden. Uh, you shall be as gods, knowing, knowing good and evil, uh, Satan made the promise to Eve. And so knowledge and information, and I'm not, I don't want to get sidetracked on, because that's a whole other thing that could be preached on for a while, is the evils of education and knowledge as opposed to the simplicity and the truth which is in Christ. Uh, because there's nothing wrong with knowledge, but what Satan promised was not knowledge. And what I'm talking about is not just general knowledge. I remember when I was a boy, um, I used to read, Sherlock Holmes, um, and so I had this intellectual desire just to be smart and have everybody think I was smart and to know everything. And so I started, uh, you know, reading books and collecting books and just trying to find stuff out and learn stuff all the time. And that has helped me in my study of the Word of God, but it has also hindered me in the fact that I just know too much, too many things that get in the way of the simple truth of, I said this, you need to do this. And you're supposed to be holding fast this simple truth that the whole world denies and is against. And you're unable to do that because you're beguiled by the information that you learn in school. Even though it had Bible college at the end of the name. And even worse than that, the, the, the crap that you learned uh, in public school uh, from science and all the things where that are where you're deliberately beguiled um, um, by by knowledge that is against the Bible, where from the beginning to the end, the spiritual end uh, of the powers that be is to steal your simple faith in the word of God. While promising, um, while promising power to succeed in life. 
Uh, but the Bible says, the, in fact, the only time the word success occurs in the whole Bible is Joshua 1.8, uh, where the formula is to meditate uh, on his words. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, he said. Amen. Uh, all right, amen. So that was kind of introductory. And Timothy is written along those lines. The war, kind of warfare that he's talking about has to do with many things. It has to do with false prophets who teach things that aren't true. It has to do with uh, brethren who aren't prophets but make up doctrines to subvert hearers, uh, which are typified by people like Janus and Jambres in the Old Testament, um, and described in detail uh, and called out. Um, the book of First and Second Timothy give instructions on how to deal with those people, how to deal with uh, the people that are affected by them. Uh, the servant of the Lord must not strive, he said. So you have to learn how to fight the battle as hard as you can in the midst of the bloodiest axe swinging, sword swinging, bombs going off battle that you can fight and have a cool head and keep composure and swing your sword while not striving in the way that he said in Second Timothy 2. And we'll, we'll cover that when, when we get to it. But it's a warfare. It's not, it's one thing to teach your children to look both ways before they cross the road. Make sure you look both ways before you cross the road. But at some point, before the child realizes and feels the weight and the importance of following that instruction, they don't realize necessarily what could happen if they disobey. And just like every child left to himself brings his mother to shame and spoil, uh, um, blah. Spare the rod, spoil the child, as the expression goes. Um, if it's not accompanied corp by corporate punishment, the child doesn't realize the consequence of it, and it becomes an academic thing, just like the kid sitting in school is presented with a series of choices. And if the Bible's even on the list of choices, it's given only as an option, something to pick from many things. And in Bible college, it's the same thing. It's just Instead of there being uh, a bunch of lost pagan options, there's, well, here's these eight interpretations of this verse, uh, only one of which, which is right, if any of them. And because it's presented as an option, you see it academically as something that you can pick and choose from. Not something that, no, God told me this, and it was clear, and he spoke to me, and the Bible says these words, and I'm rightly dividing it, and I'm reading it soundly, and I'm not resting it, and I prayed about those things and asked God to help me, and I was sincere and unfeigned in my approach, and God showed me, but now I have an excuse because everybody around me is picking, picking and choosing as they see fit, as they not as they see fit, as is most convenient for them, see? So I'm speaking kind of harshly about these things because I'm trying to find the spirit of the of the way that this book is is written, the way that this book in particular is written, as a father writing to his son in the faith, and we'll talk more about what he means by father son, um, if if we get to it this time, but I think probably next time. Um, my point is just that is that this book is a lot harder to the point where even the scholars. Uh, even the technical language scholars, uh, uh, you know, uh, Scrivener and, and these, these folks, they specific, that people that write, you know, uh, manuals of manuscript, uh, the language of the Greek New Testament and these things, they all make particular, they all make particular note of the rudeness and harshness of the way that Paul talks in these letters to the point where even it even causes them to deny the authenticity and can canonicity of this book. By that, I just mean they say it shouldn't be there. And it should be there. And that needs to be fought against. Amen? But it doesn't need to be fought against in your wisdom as a Bible-believing scholar. It needs to be fought against as a servant and a follower of Jesus Christ according to the very instructions that he gives in this book. See? 
Do you see the difference there? There is a world of difference between those two approaches. Amen. And uh, we can see the difference in tone um, as we read the first verse. So let's do that. Let's read the first verse. Amen. <laughs> Usually I start, Amory said, finally. Uh, so the first epistle of the apostle of Paul the apostle to Timothy. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now notice he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Daniel's preached before on um, the apostleship of Paul and the apostles, and that was good stuff. So I won't re-preach that. Um. But I want you to notice that he claims here that his apostleship is by the commandment of Jesus Christ. In another place, uh, in Ephesians, he says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and of the faithful in Christ Jesus. Um, and in another place, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So his apostleship is by commandment, it's by the will of God, it's by calling. But here he's emphasizing the fact that it's by commandment because he's passing on a commandment to his son that he received from God by commandment. Um, not his apostleship, but uh, he's saying, look, I'm giving you these commands, don't feel bad. What I got to do, I do because I'm commanded. See? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, about this verse, that Jesus Christ is our hope. So, unlike some false religions, which are dealt with in this book, Roman Catholicism specifically, Jesus Christ is our hope, not uh, the sacraments, not... Uh, well, if we abstain from marriage and uh, abstain from meats and keep Lent and uh, get, live our whole lives as a good Catholic and put ashes on our forehead and Palm Sunday and all the stuff and do good works. And f I forget they got some name for doing good works uh, that one of one of Anne Marie's friends mentioned to us the last time we talked to them. Um, they got some fancy Latin term for, you know, for doing good. <laughs> Because that's how you get to heaven, amen. Not me, but not me. I'm I'm the guy that can't even look towards heaven because I'm out with my face on the ground every night when I go to bed. God be merciful to me, a sinner. I messed up here. I messed up here. I messed up here. I'm trying so hard to do right, or I didn't try. I deliberately did wrong. Please forgive me. And then the moment I do that, I am clean. I am forgiven, and I can start fresh with a brand new uh, step forward the next day. Every night I can do that because of Jesus Christ. See, what is that? That's hope. That's not extortion. Like, I'm going to hold this guilt over you so you can pay us more money uh, to get your dead grandmother out of purgatory. No. That's not uh, people who spend their whole living uh, supporting the church uh, and giving their whole life and belief and faith over to something where they don't even care about you. They only, they're only interested in you for what they can get from you, namely your money, and power over you to control you, and uh, some sick, dark uh, other things that happen in Catholicism, like little boys being molested because you're not allowed to have wives, for example, which is wicked and evil, obviously, that even needs to be said. But I mention those things because Je because Jesus Christ mentions them in chapter 4 of this book. Uh, and I'm not preaching on chapter 4 today. I'm just giving you kind of a preview. But what I want you to notice and remember from what I'm preaching to you today is that it is Jesus Christ which is our hope. It is not any other thing. Jesus, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the only hope that anybody ever has of getting to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our hope. He's called the hope of Israel. 
uh, in one place because it's the same thing for the nation of Israel. Their only hope is Jesus Christ. Uh, just like ours is. Uh, Christ hath, uh, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus Christ is where your hope should be. So I can make a doctrinal statement about that, because this verse does, and many other verses do. And I can get all theological and say, yes, Jesus Christ is our hope. Let's put that on the chalkboard, write it in the book, put it in the commentary, and you can read it one day when you pull it off the shelf and remember it when it's time to teach a Sunday school class. Or you can apply that to your life and set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You can fix your hope for every situation that you have in your life on Jesus Christ. Boy, I'm having this trouble with my job. Well, uh, a college degree ain't going to fix it. Jesus Christ is the only one who can fix it. If he, if he wants it fixed. Maybe he wants you to suffer. Maybe he wants you to lose your job so you can suffer so he can reward you more. Maybe he's giving you a reward pillow that all you have to do is lie back on. <laughs> but you and your stubbornness <laughs> are so fixed. See? Set your hope on Jesus Christ. So so many times, so many people, uh, especially in this day and age in America, of wealth and prosperity and more money money coming out of our eyeballs, and not knowing where it's where it's uh, it's a gospel that is preached that you have to set mo- enough money aside so that you don't have to work as soon as you possibly can. And if God blesses you with that, then Amen. You know, Amen. If you work, if you work enough to get enough money to not have to work. Amen. Amen. But don't make your hope about your rest in this life. Make your hope in Jesus Christ. I hope that Jesus Christ comes back. There's a whole crown that is promised, uh, for those that love his appearing. Make Jesus Christ your hope. First of all, because there's no hope without Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And starting in verse 11. Wherefore, remember. See? Now, I talked to you before about Jews and Gentiles and how that's that in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. And how the middle wall of, is broken down between us in Christ. In Christ now. Uh, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And he says in Romans chapter um, 15, Wherefore receive one, receive ye one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, speaking of Jews and Gentiles receiving one another. But he still wants you to remember where you come from, Gentile. And that's you and me. That's uh, our ancestors, you and me. That's uh, a bunch of barbarians sitting around in the woods drinking blood, talking about impaling people on spikes. That's where we come from, the barbarian tribes uh, that, that form Europe. That's our lineage uh, in the flesh. Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles who lorded over you, as Jesus Christ said. Power hungry. And so Gentiles is not spoken of in the New Testament as a as a positive thing, he, or in the Old Testament either, as a matter of fact. But he's, he said in chapter 2 of Galatians, uh, we who are Jew, uh, Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, they're sinners of the Jews too, obviously. But he said sinners of the Gentiles, because we're a bunch of pigs rolling around in the mud. He said to the uh, the woman at the well, um, is it meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs? And then what did he do? He took the children's bread and gave it to dog. Amen. See? Now, that will hurt your pride, Gentile, but you need to get over that. Because that's where you come from in the flesh. That's where you come from. Look at verse uh, Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember, 
that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. See? So, by yourself, in all the glory of your race, where are you going to get? Where is that going to get you? It's going to get you without Christ, having no hope. But in Christ, by His blood, you are made nigh, He said. There's no hope without Christ, but in Christ is complete hope. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that we're saved by hope. And in that passage, um, he's not talking about salvation from hell. He's speaking specifically in reference to the, the uh, adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Uh, and he says we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, what doth he had hope for? But if we... Uh, Patiently uh, turn there, Romans chapter 8, so I don't uh, misquote it. Romans chapter 8, and look down in verse uh, verse 23, uh, 22 rather. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So the whole creation is suffering because of the curse of sin and the law. Verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we're, we're groaning and travailing within ourselves, save people who have the Holy Ghost. Even uh, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. See, we're waiting for that. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? We don't see it yet, but we're waiting for it. We're hoping for it. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So we're saved by hope in the sense that God helps us to keep from sin. God helps us to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. God helps us to purify us. In the words of 1 John 3, he that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Because hoping and keeping our heart and our minds fixed on Jesus Christ and and his appearing will help to keep us from sin. Amen. You keep your mind on... uh, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Keep your heart and mind on, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Keep your heart and mind on Revelation 19, 20, 21. Keep your heart and mind, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Keep your heart and mind fixed. And set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. See? Keep your heart in mind, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Keep your heart and mind fixed on those things. See? And that will help you. Which is our hope. Now I'm preaching all these things to you as if it was a major component of the book of Timothy. and it's And it's not. It is understood at the start of the book of Timothy because he mentions it in passing and reminds you Jesus Christ is our hope. And all these things that I'm preaching is included in that one little phrase. Remember, Jesus Christ is our hope. Because we're about to get into these hard things of conflicts that you're going to have with the brethren. Of conflicts of faith that you're going to have within yourself. Of evil doctrines that false religions are going to propagate, of false prophets, of sin, of uh, of evil men and seducers, and I and it's my job to commit to you, to charge you, and to exhort you 
to the end of the commandment is a charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. To have those three things. And this is how you keep those things. These are the instructions that you have to follow. Which are not uh, typically the way that pastors and uh, Bible believers tend to handle things. They have their own schemes. They have their own ways of handling things. Uh, which has swerved uh, concerning faith in 1 Timothy 6.20, or made shipwreck uh, in the case of Hymenaeus and Alexander. Uh, but in, wor- in the words of uh, 2 Timothy 3, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Or to paraphrase that in the way that my father used to, to say it to me is, I really don't care what the rest of the world is doing. You are my son, and I told you right. You had no excuse for acting that way. Amen? Because information, truth, rather, we'll find out, uh, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth is an expression used in these books, um, is not something that you can find um, although there's truth everywhere, the world is held together by the Word of God, uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And the, in all of existence, even the wicked uh, are manifestations of the truth. And every lie, every lie that was ever told is like 99% true, which is why uh, it's, I'm exaggerating, but the really good lies that everybody goes after are like 99% true, but it's that 1% that makes them false. And it's your job, preacher, to get the 1%. Not to be 1%, like you're better than everybody else, because you're not. You're supposed to esteem others better than yourself. But that doesn't change the instructions of, I have to follow these instructions, and it doesn't make me better than you. I have to follow these instructions. I have a sacred duty that's been charged to me by God, my my heavenly Father, and by my father, uh, Paul, who led me to the Lord in the case of Timothy. And in the case of any father, son, in the flesh who's saved and believes the Bible, uh, the same thing. See, you're supposed to impart these things. And sons, you're supposed to receive them. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Um, all right, turn to First Thessalonians four. First Thessalonians four. And here's another example. Uh, Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now he mentions that, and I preached to you about it. But he mentions it incidentally, like you're supposed to already understand this. I just remind it. I just remind you in a couple words, because you need to have that knowledge uh, for what I'm about to get into. We're about to get into a whole other level of how you deal with people and the things that you have to face and the challenges that you're going to go through in your heart and the personal choices that you're going to have to make of interpretation and of relationships and of friendships. See? And, and in some cases, you're going to have to choose, as we'll find out in this book. And in some cases... Um, The choice will be made for you. But your instructions are to keep the things that you're charged with. Your instructions that no matter what is going on in the world, or no matter what your best friend says, or frankly, no matter what I say, if I start giving you a line of bull, you need to do right. You need to go back to the time where I told you do right no matter what. My father, at times in my life, uh, uh, and I don't want to do anything but honor him. I love my father very much. I think he was the best father I could have had. And he wasn't no preacher or pastor or evangelist, or um, although he did lead people to the Lord, so you could call him an evangelist. But he didn't have any office or job or go around getting meetings and taking money. He didn't do anything like that. But he was a man of God, sure enough. And he taught me these things, and he imparted them to me, no matter what even other people in my family were doing. 
And at times in life, as I grew older and learned things and grew in the Lord and came across things that the Lord forced to come up, where I had to make a choice between, well, my daddy told me this, but the Bible says this. He's wrong about that. Then I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice, see. Keep that which is committed to thy charge, I'm saying. Go back to the time where I told you to follow the Bible no matter what. Amen. All right, First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4. And look down in verse uh, 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's uh, dead. As we find out later, dead in Christ shall rise first. At the end of verse 16. That save people who have died that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. See, it's understood because you have Jesus Christ in you, because you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, uh, which is this mystery among the Gentiles, uh, Colossians chapter 1, that it's understood that you have hope and you don't have any reason to sorrow like everybody else does who doesn't have hope. See? Having no hope and without God in the world. But you have Jesus Christ, so what are you feeling sorry about? Well, this happened. I messed up here and it made a shipwreck and this and this and this. Okay. Put it, uh, confess it to God, get it right, and do right. And you can be cleansed of that today, this moment. What you don't have to do is sorrow because you can remember that Jesus Christ will return and appear and you will be redeemed adopted, that your body will be changed, and you will be with Him in glory and share in His glory. You can remember that right now today, you're seated with Him at the right hand of God. Today, right now, you are. You can remember that and have hope, see? That's one of the characteristics of what it means to be a Christian the way that God intended it in these words. You have hope, so you don't ever have to feel sorry for yourself. You don't have to ever have to spend time uh, moping, or, or hiding, or, or, uh, and I'm not saying there's not time for tears, and everybody suffers, and everybody has these things in the flesh, but at the end of the day, and I'm as, and I'm as much as anybody, I spent years of my life feeling sorry for myself. But at the end of the day, what pulled me out of that was, hey, it's time to quit doing that, Jeff. Remember? Remember the hope that you have? See? Remember, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So you don't need to worry about your father who died. You don't need to go to the church and pay uh, for indulgences so that he can get out of purgatory. You can be settled and sure and look forward and be happy about the fact that you're going to see him when you die. You can have peace in your heart that the world does not understand because you put things in God's hands instead of taking them into your own hands. You can have peace and certainty and knowledge that you're going to see Him again. And even in your own suffering, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Having the same conflict which ye see, see in me and now here to be in me. See? Even in the in the midst of the most... What I'm talking about is a guy burning at the stake, quoting Psalm 119 and singing hymns. That's the kind of peace I'm talking about. You say, well, he had his doctrine all messed up. Yeah, well, he had the New Testament down better than you and me. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, we're saved by hope. Um... And I won't get into the next verse uh, tonight just because uh, for the sake of time. And uh, I think I gave you enough uh, to help you. Uh, and to, uh, not that you didn't know those things, you know, but it's my job to put you in remembrance of them. Amen. Uh, so, uh, son, would you, would you close in a word of prayer? Thanks for your word. Thanks for Jeff preaching it. Thank you for just being a good God to us. Um, we don't deserve anything that you've given us. We thank you for your grace, the mercy that you've given to us. And I pray that you'll help us to follow these things.
uh, that your word says. Um, help us to take the correction from your word that it gives us uh, when you chastise us, when you you speak sternly with us as a father would. Help us not to be hardened like the fool in Proverbs who hardeneth his neck when he's often reproved. Um, help us when we're reproved to receive the instruction, to love wisdom, to love knowledge. Amen. Um, whatever form it comes in, uh, whether it comes like a dessert on a plate we want to eat or it comes like a cough medicine that we just hate choking down. Lord, help us to receive your words, believe them, and to keep them. And uh, thank you for this instruction on First Timothy. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I just stop now. It's the black square next to the report button.